5 is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate for the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate or encourage any illegal activity and advise all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws by visiting normal.org, N-O-R-M-L dot org. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers of Normal Show Live are their own and do not necessarily reflect the philosophy and policies of Normal. Listener discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think that we need to rethink and re-criminalize our marijuana laws. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws presents... Normal Show Live, Marijuana Nation. Now, here's your host, Normal's Outreach Coordinator, Radical Russ Belleville. Good afternoon, tokers and tokettes. Welcome. It is Thursday, October 13th, 2011, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. I hope you're having a good time wherever you're at, and I hope all your harvests are bountiful. Thanks for joining us here for the show. We got all sorts of great stuff coming up on today's show, and the best part of the show, of course, as always, is joining up with Cannabis Carrie in the beautiful Grastoria Studios. How you doing, Carrie? I'm doing great, Russ. It is beautiful out here. I wish everyone could live in the Northwest in the fall. Oh, yeah. The the uh, the colors are turning from blue and green to gray. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what we got here in the Pacific Northwest. How you doing up there, Carrie? Oh, we're doing great. Doing all, great. It's gorgeous out here. All right. So uh, on today's show, we've got all sorts of interesting stuff to bring to you. And we're going to begin with our hemp headlines. And Carrie's got the headlines for us. So what's in the news today? Well, today we're going to talk about uh, the uh, California dispensary crackdown. Uh, Some of those dispensaries are already feeling the heat. We're also going to go to Colorado and talk about the finances behind question 300 in Fort Collins. And uh, we've heard the story before, but the latest scientists to lash out at the federal government. All right. And uh, just as I was getting ready for the program today, I got an alert from Tony Newman at the Drug Policy Alliance. Some shocking testimony in a Brooklyn police officer from the New York Police Department uh, testifying today on uh, framing, basically framing people for drug crimes. We'll talk more about that in our hemp headlines here right after this first break. Also on today's show, it is Grooving Thursday brought to you by JohnDoRadio.com. So uh, today, John Doe is bringing us some music from Elite, and it's a tune called Gone. And then at half past, an uh, interesting uh, segment that I picked up from another podcast, our own Paul Armentano, the deputy director of Normal and uh, one of the co-driving people. The 10th in high school. That's right, it's a minute. The uh, rights that aren't delegated to the feds in the Constitution are delegated to the states and to the people, and uh, they cover all of these states' rights issues. And, of course, there's no bigger states' rights issue today in the news than medical marijuana. So Paul was on the show to discuss that and the recent crackdown by the ATF on the Second Amendment rights of medical marijuana patients. So uh, we'll get you that clip. Uh, If you want to hear the full episode, it's available at 10thamendmentcenter.com. And then at the end of the show, time for a little radical rant, uh, amazing data that I pulled off of Alternet about the DEA's approval of the increase of OxyContin. You won't believe how much they allowed OxyContin pills to increase during the medical marijuana era. All that and more coming up on today's Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. Stick around, you might learn something. This is Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. 
There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that gives us these precious rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all of my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search or seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak with my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. What's up, guys? I'm Rory from Revolution, showing at the Spring Fest, San Bernardino, California. Just chilling at the normal live. Want to say what's up and keep it green. Weedmaps.com. I'm Radical Russ from Normal. In my job as outreach coordinator, I travel every month. And when I'm on the road, I need a fast, accurate way to find the medical marijuana dispensaries in the area. So I turn to Weedmaps.com. Weedmaps.com has the best dispensary locator online or on your mobile device. Search by zip code or let Weedmaps find you, and in seconds you'll have the addresses, phone numbers, and customer service reviews for the medical marijuana dispensaries in the local area. Weedmaps.com also has a section devoted to helping you find a doctor who understands and recommends medical marijuana under your state's law. You can even check prices on the medical marijuana stock exchange. Coming soon, you'll even be able to find the listings of normal attorneys and chapters, local head shops and grow shops, and the best weed-friendly businesses. Weedmaps.com has the information you need to be an informed cannabis consumer. Visit Weedmaps.com today, a proud sponsor of the Normal Network. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, consumer cannabis. It's time for this week's Normal News with Cannabis Carry. The pressure on California dispensaries in the wake of those new round of letters from U.S. attorneys is already taking its toll. In the Orange County city of Lake Forest, eight owners of medical marijuana dispensaries have been given three days to shut down. A three-day notice to abate was sent to their attorneys on Wednesday from their landlord asking them to cease and desist from any and all sales, distribution, cultivation, or possession of marijuana at said premises or be required to quit and deliver up possession of the premises three days after getting the notice. In Lake Forest and all over the state, medical marijuana attorneys are meeting together to discuss and plan their defenses against federal prosecution. The eight dispensaries in question had been targeted by efforts of the city of Lake Forest that ended up spending $600,000 in legal fees trying to get them to shut down. That battle continues to get tied up in the courts, costing both sides hundreds of thousands of dollars. That is precisely why U.S. Attorney Andre Barot says he is targeting those eight dispensaries because the city needed their help. The battle has always centered on zoning issues, and in this case, all of the businesses are located in one large strip mall. All eight stores are located on the second floor of the building, but the property is across the street from a preschool that also serves some kindergartners. On Wednesday, authorities seized $136,686 from the bank accounts of the building owner. The federal crackdown is expected to continue to target commercial marijuana businesses, according to Barot, including retail stores and mobile delivery services. California has recognized marijuana as a legal medical treatment since 1996, but the U.S. maintains that overtly commercial medical marijuana enterprises have proliferated California, producing millions in profits for people that have no role in helping the sick. One attorney who represents one of the condemned eight businesses in Lake Forest says that the government's bullying tactics are working by forcing reluctant property owners to do the illegal job of the city to get rid of legal patient organizations in the town. Now, there are protests against the recent federal crackdown on medical marijuana being planned in Los Angeles and Riverside on October 24th. And organizers are saying they are also planning on a rally at the mall in Washington, D.C. So far, attorneys in California have advised their clients to stay vigilant in serving only those with legal identification and follow state law closely, possibly prohibiting serving those under 21. That addresses a federal law that prohibits giving drugs or alcohol to minors. We will keep you posted on the movement of the feds through California and any protest that springs from that. Well, you got to really do a double take at that quote. Uh, These people making millions of dollars who have no role in helping the sick. No role in helping the sick. Uh, Wait a minute. They're producing and distributing medical marijuana. Uh, By definition, they're helping the sick. 
unless you're trying to tell me that not one single sick person goes through the doors of those dispensaries to get any of their cannabis is the only way that you can say they have no role in helping the sick. Now, depending on what they consider sick to be, of course, they they think the only people that should have medical marijuana ought to be, you know, uh, paralyzed people in wheelchairs, people on their deathbeds, you know. They don't think that you ought to use medical marijuana as a substitute or in exchange for, say, uh, uh, popping a Tylenol when you get a headache. But why not? In the state of California, it says that for any other condition for which a doctor believes marijuana can provide relief. I'm sorry that someone with a headache or someone with anxiety or or having trouble getting to sleep doesn't seem to qualify as sick enough for you. But gee, they seem to be sick enough for you to uh, sell them an Ambien, sick enough for you to sell them an Excedrin. Come on now, medical marijuana should not be the medicine of last resort. Considering how non-toxic it is and how little side effects it is, it ought to be the medicine of first resort. Shame on the Obama administration for bringing these heavy-handed tactics for threatening landlords who are doing nothing more than getting a commercial tenant in one of the worst economies for business that we've ever lived through. You're slitting these guys' throats if you're trying to get uh, more jobs, more uh, local uh, revenue in the economy. Me, why would you want to kill the jobs and kill the economic opportunity that is being provided by medical marijuana? Ah, I'll tell you why. Because those medical marijuana people, if they get organized and they have money, they might put it toward promoting the legalization of marijuana in California, Colorado, and other states on the 2012 ballot. And big pharma's uh, lackeys in the White House and Congress just can't have that. <laughs> The battle for medical marijuana dispensaries in Fort Collins, Colorado, has created a money war, and the opponents of that ballot measure that would ban medical marijuana businesses in the city appear to be winning. Citizens for Safer Neighborhoods is one group campaigning against Question 300 that will be on the November 1st ballot that asks voters to ban any medical marijuana businesses. According to campaign finance finance reports that were filed this week, they have raised $84,135 so far and spent roughly $60,000 of that. Now, another group that's also campaigning against the ban is Families for Safe, Secure, and Regulated Access. They've raised $24,754 for their efforts opposing the ban and have only spent about $5,000 of that money. So far, that group has mostly been funded by a committee of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union. Now, they contributed $22,000 to campaign through in-kind services such as staff time and resources. Some local medical marijuana workers are members of that union. So out of the more than $100, $108,000 raised by those opposing Question 300 in Fort Collins. The group that worked so hard to put that question on the ballot, the Concerned Fort Collins Citizen Group, have raised just under 14000 Group Chairman Bob Powell says that he isn't concerned about the difference in raised funds. He said his group has done the hard work of getting the question to the voters, and now they only need to talk to people. Plus, he expects more money to be raised as the campaign moves forward. He says the big dollars on the other side is coming from local medical marijuana businesses. He also says the opponents to the ban are spending their money on campaign managers and political consultants. Now, if the ban passes by the voters, 20 Fort Collins medical marijuana businesses will have just 90 days to close down. Once again, Let's close down some businesses. Let's put some people out of jobs and let's make it tougher for sick people to be able to get their medicine. Uh, although, although there will be some job creation in this, there'll be job creation for the drug dealers of the Fort Collins area, for the people that want to sell out of their uh, backyard, people want to sell in the park. Those guys will have plenty more jobs, but not the people that want to run a respectable business, contribute taxes to the uh, to the local economy. It's just ridiculous. And and by the way, what were Carrie? What were the names of the these two uh, parents groups again? Uh, the gr- the concerned Fort Collins citizen group that actually put it on the ballot. The other groups that are opposing the ban would be Citizens for Safer Neighborhoods and um, also Families for Safe, Secure, and Regulated Access. Families for Safe, Secure, Committees for... Sa- uh, hey, look, I got a new name for them. People United for Safe, Healthy Youth. Pushy. That's what these people are. Pushy, trying to push their morals down our throats here when we have legal medical marijuana well regulated in the state of Colorado. But they want to try to bring up this chimera of somehow that uh, uh, having medical marijuana shops, well regulated medical marijuana shops, is going to hurt the neighborhoods or the children. What hurts the neighborhoods and the children more is having this stuff out in the black market, having this uh, these deals being done without regulation, without oversight, without security 
cameras. You're doing exactly the opposite of what your names claim to be doing, and that is trying to create safe neighborhoods. A well-known researcher and professor at the University of Arizona College of Medicine in Phoenix, Sue Sisley, took her time in front of a panel of teachers, doctors, and patients this week to criticize the National Institute on Drug Abuse for obstructing a study on the medicinal value of marijuana. Sisley, who teaches psychiatry and internal medicine, spoke to the audience of doctors and medical marijuana patients about her struggles with her FDA-approved study and what it has encountered. She referred to the National Institute on Drug Abuse as a government enforcement monopoly on the legal supply of marijuana for research and called the agency one of the biggest obstacles to having legitimate research into the medical properties of the plant. Sicily did receive FDA approval of the study protocol marijuana in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. The next step is to seek approval from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, who has so far yet to even respond to the study protocol submission. As has been the case in other study requests, they may never respond, meaning her project may never be allowed to continue. She did praise the University of Arizona College of Medicine for having the courage to support her by recognizing that research into the medical benefits of marijuana is legitimate research. Her presentation was part of the College Science Discussion Series, and she stress the importance of research to help us improve the body of knowledge that we have about the medical uses of marijuana, but says only through an FDA-approved study can we get that analysis. She also pointed out that politics getting in the way of important medical research is not just a problem in marijuana research. The political climate during the Bush administration made stem cell research impossible in the U.S. Well, we've already heard this from uh, National Institutes of Drug Abuse before. Paul Armentano brought it to our attention on the normal front page in one of his posts where he actually got the quote, the quote from these National Institutes of Drug Abuse people uh, from the New York Times where they say, we don't fund the uh, study of marijuana for beneficial medical purposes. I'm paraphrasing the quote here. But they basically don't want to find out anything good about marijuana. They fund the studies that are trying to find something bad about marijuana. And even then, they get shocked. I mean, they funded uh, 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 Donald Tashkin to try to prove the connection between uh, marijuana smoking and lung cancer. And in 2006, he announced, hey, we found just the opposite. People that smoke pot have lower incidence of lung cancer. Uh, so you can't stop the science on this. NIDA is going to keep trying. And in the meantime, hundreds of thousands of, of people that could benefit from marijuana, including our soldiers returning from Iraq and Afghanistan with severe post-traumatic stress disorder, are suffering while NIDA continues to block the science. All right, we've got one quick story here to update you on uh, breaking news uh, coming out of New York, and this is from the Drug Policy Alliance press release. Former New York Police Department detective testifies that police regularly plant drugs on innocent people to meet arrest quota. Stephen Anderson, a former New York Police Department narcotics detective, testified yesterday that he regularly saw police plant drugs on innocent people as a way to meet arrest quotas. Mr. Anderson is testifying under cooperation with prosecutors after he was busted for planting cocaine on four men in a bar in Queens. Quote, it was something I was seeing a lot of, whether it was from supervisors or undercovers or even investigators, end quote, says Anderson. Quote, one of the consequences of the war on drugs is that police officers are pressured to make large numbers of arrests, and it's easy for some of the less honest cops to plant evidence on innocent people, end quote, said Gabriel Sag of the Drug Policy Alliance. Quote, the drug war inevitably leads to crooked policing and quotas further incentivize such practices, end quote. The PD is also also come under heat recently for arresting more than 50,000 people last year for low-level marijuana offenses, 86% of whom are black and Latino, making marijuana possession the number one offense in the city. Most of these arrests are the result of illegal searches by the NYPD as part of its controversial stop-and-frisk practices. Marijuana was decriminalized in New York State in 1977, and that law is still on the books. Smoking marijuana in public, or having marijuana visible in public, however, remains a crime. Most people arrested for marijuana possession are not smoking in public, but simply have a small amount in their pocket, purse, or bag. Often when people stop and question a person, they say, empty your pockets or open your bag. Many people comply even though they're not legally required to do so. If a person pe pulls marijuana from their pocket or bag, it is then open to public view and the police can then arrest the person. 
Last month, in a rare admission of NYPD wrongdoing, Police Commissioner Ray Kelly ordered all officers to stop charging people with misdemeanor marijuana violations based on improper searches. The new policy directive comes on the heels of a 2011 report released by DPA highlighting the enormous costs of marijuana arrests in New York and a public pressure campaign by advocacy groups and elected officials. NYPD, we are watching you. It is time to stop this drug war corruption. Let's get an end to this war on marijuana, end to this war on drugs, so we can once again trust that our police officers are really here to protect and serve us. All right, well, that means it's time for a break, and when we come back, we'll have JohnDoRadio.com bringing you your Groovin' Thursday music. Stick around, it's still Normal Show Live. It's 20 after the hour, and we have to take a short break. If you know what I mean. Please support these sponsors who support Normal Show Live. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would say to South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. High Times Medical Cannabis Cup is coming to Detroit on October 15th and 16th. That's right. The world's premier medical marijuana competition will be in Motown to celebrate the cannabis economy of the Great Lakes State. It's a two-day expo at Burt's Warehouse Theater, showcasing the movers and shakers of the Michigan medical marijuana industry and the merchandise that makes the machine go. There will be seminars with leaders of the medical marijuana movement, doctors, patients, researchers, growers, dispensary owners, and activists. Plus, High Times' own cultivation editors Danny Danko and Nico Escondido will roll into the town with the goods on growing great ganja. Be there for an amazing Saturday night VIP party featuring top musical performances and special guests. High Times will award the Medical Cannabis Cup for top indicas, sativas, hybrids, concentrates, and edibles entered by Michigan's dispensaries and collectives. Come to Birch Warehouse Theater on October 15th and 16th. Visit MedCanCup.com for all the details. Celebrate cannabis in Michigan. Celebrate the resurgence of Detroit. Be part of the growing cannabis community. Almost busted in Laredo, but for reasons that I'd rather not disclose. I smoke pot, and I like it a lot. Hi, this is Willie Nelson. I learned a long time ago that marijuana is a lot safer to use than alcohol. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana by adults. It's time we stopped arresting and started respecting responsible marijuana smokers in America. And to learn what you can do to help, please contact Normal at www.norml.org or call toll-free at 888-67-NORMAL. The show was long and we were just sitting there and we'd come to play and not just for the ride. Russ Belleville. Yeah, he's a scurvy dog. In today's busy world, we're inundated by advertising for all types of pharmaceuticals that come with a laundry list of potential side effects. Shouldn't you have better medical choices? Natural alternatives to pills pushed by Big Pharma? At Alternative Medical Choices, you could choose natural, safe, and effective alternative therapies that are right for your budget without nasty side effects. Cannabis or marijuana, legal medicine since 19... ...when your qualifications for where you live. Our massage therapy seed oil... For cannabis infused massage salves, we also offer acupuncture, Reiki, and other alternative health therapies. Call Alternative Medical Choices in Portland, Oregon at 503 288 5579 or visit our website at www.altmedchoices.com. We specialize in out of state recommendations. That's www.altmedchoices.com or call 503 288 5579. It's time for your daily Toker Tunes, the best in 420 friendly music from all genres that uplifts, entertains, and informs the public. Today we bring you tunes for Groovin' Thursday, our salute to all the dopest beats and killer rhymes that we find in the best of rap, hip-hop, soul, R&B, and funk. 
If you'd like to submit your song to be played on Normal Show Live, send it to us at stash at normal.org. Now here's some more great independent marijuana music for today's Daily Toker Tunes. The John Doe Radio Show. John Doe here with the Groovin Thursday tune on Normal Show Live. Artist's name is Elite. Song is called Gone. A former producer, probably still produces, but used to produce in-house for the Rough Riders label. You know, DMX, that whole crew, you know, the stop, drop, shut up. All right, we don't need to go anymore with that. A white guy also. A lot of white rappers coming out right now. The other white guy that I'm kind of looking at right now, Machine Gun Kelly with a new song called On Fire. So go check that out. Maybe we'll play that soon here on Normal Show Live. But today, like I said, Elite song is called Gone. If you would like to find any more from this guy, there are a bunch of mixtape stuff out there for him. His real name is Anthony Perino. As I said again, his stage name, though, is Elite. So check it out. Enjoy, and thank you to Normal Show Live. Check out the John Doe Radio Show on Normal Show Live, Monday through Friday, 7 o'clock Pacific, 8 o'clock Mountain Time. Thank you very much. Radical Russ Belleville, Ganja John, Cannabis Carry, Coleco, everybody associated with Normal Show Live, including the listeners. Until we meet again next week, I am John Doe. See ya. Where I've been, get up on my shit, there I am, gone, take a look, stay again, yeah, it's time to pay attention, ain't nobody out just doing nothing like I'm doing, yeah, money from the wing, but still I'm sending Patrick Yorn, and I'm gone, we gon' hop up in this plane, ain't no stopping, ain't no landing to the top, and now this plane, and I'ma shoot for the stars, shoot for the Mars, I don't need a hand, but I do get applause, shit, yeah, I know, who would've thought, I got on, cause I proved you wrong. Yes, motherfucker, right? Boy, you better watch me around your girl if you don't fuck her right. Shout to L, time will tell. Some belong, some gon' fail, some go wrong, some go well, bitch, but I don't care. I'm gone. Clear. Gotta make sure I'm not misleading I know that you depending on me for now But just know When I get on, I swear that you ain't gotta work no more I'ma be that son, be that one Never gonna stop till I see that come Long as I breathe out lungs and I bleed out blood I'ma see that we got funds, uh Better believe I'm leaving for a good reason I'ma be the one to move us out these bleachers for the season I'ma lead us, I'ma take us I'ma be the one to make it I'ma chase it, I believe it I can see it, I can taste it I don't care if I don't sleep I don't motherfucking need it This could be the last time we ever speak Cause I'm deleted I'm gone Copy of that song for your iPod? Check out the Daily Toker Tunes at the Stash blog by surfing to stash.normal.org and choosing media and then Toker Tunes from the main menu. Ever wonder how often to change your bong water? 
the most effective method for baking pot brownies, the best destinations for a ganja getaway, how to hide herb in your car, whether to grow your own, how precisely to legalize it, or how something as wonderful as marijuana ever got to be illegal in the first place. Finally, you can find all these answers and much more in the official High Times Pot Smokers Handbook, featuring 420 things to do when you're stoned. Since 1974, High Times Magazine has covered marijuana in all its aspects and wonders, from cultivation to legalization to the herbs enduring and exalted place in popular culture. Packed with inside information, the official High Times Pot Smokers Handbook rolls all of this collected wisdom together into a single indispensable ganja guide, including an entertaining look at marijuana's history. Profiles of herb-friendly travel destinations and festivals, favorite potluck recipes from the High Times staff, smoking skills, advocacy and activism, essential marijuana movies and songs, profiles of famous cannabis strains, comprehensive growing information, celebrity endorsements, and much more. This is truly, finally, the ultimate guide to green living. Normal Show Live reminds you to never consent to a search. If you're holding and you consent, in most states you will be arrested immediately and you will go to jail. If you don't consent to a search, police may try to intimidate you by threatening to bring in drug-sniffing dogs or try to fool you by saying things will go easier if you consent. Yeah, easier for them, sure. Stand your ground, refuse the search, and ask the officer if you're free to go. If they still detain you and eventually find your contraband, you'll be no more busted than if you had allowed the search. But by refusing the search, your attorney has a chance to win your acquittal before a judge. If you consent to the search, your attorney's hands are tied. You can find a list of normal legal committee attorneys specializing in marijuana cases by visiting the Find a Lawyer link at normal.org. You can't do that to our pledges. Only we can do that to our pledges. Starfish Designs, makers of the original Gandalf. I'm Radical Russ, and when I want to relax, I always have my 17-inch long original Gandalf from Starfish Designs nearby. The hand-blown borosilicate glass is strong and easy to clean, and the design is sleek and sophisticated. Starfish designs are available from Bend, Oregon at a glass retailer near you. For locations, call 541-788-GLASS. That's 541-788-4527. Normal has been the place to go for the latest studies and news on marijuana science, policy, and activism. For over a decade, one man at Normal has written and reviewed more studies and news stories regarding marijuana than most anyone on the planet. First as senior policy analyst and now as deputy director, Normal's Paul Amentano has written for major newspapers, academic journals, and magazines on the subject of cannabis and is frequently requested as an expert witness in the courtroom. His knowledge and experience are an amazing asset to the cannabis community. Available to you now in a segment we call Behind the Headlines with Paul Armentano. Paul recently appeared on 10th Amendment Radio. Here's a clip. The United States Constitution does not permit the federal government to make growing things in your backyard illegal, whether it's a radish or a potato or, I don't know, a can of plant. It doesn't permit them to tell you what you can eat or drink as evidenced by the need for a constitutional amendment to ban alcohol so many years ago. And uh, the Commerce Clause regulates interstate commerce, commerce uh, that's going across state lines, not commerce happening within a state. Joining us to talk about these issues and how the feds are violating the Constitution in many ways on these lines is Paul Armentano. Welcome back to the show, Deputy Director of Normal. Paul, are you with us? I am. It's good to be here. So, Paul, it seems like the uh, Obama administration is stepping up its attack on have expertise to a particular what's what's going on on friday department of justice held a conference and this press conference included the four u.s attorneys uh, from california and they basically laid out an action plan of the efforts that they have been taking and that they intend to take going forward and the goal of these efforts clearly uh is to stifle or shut down the presently above ground marketplace uh, for medical marijuana and the federal government made clear uh, that among the tools they were going to use to try and accomplish these goals were to target the landlords 
who rent the properties of uh, where these dispensary operators uh, presently operate, and that the federal government was threatening to seize their property and to prosecute the landlords along with the tenants. Uh, the federal government has uh, sicked the IRS on the uh, tax filers who operate these dispensaries that these are standard business deductions uh, and that, in fact, they, uh, these operators that have been filing their federal taxes, and of course the federal government's been uh, cashing their checks for years, uh, now own millions of dollars in back taxes. Uh, the Obama picked the Department of Treasury to go after the state and local banks in places like Colorado and California and said, as banks, as financial institutions, you can no longer do business with any of these operators, even if they are legally compliant with the laws of their state. And as I know you're going to talk about later in the show, uh, the ATF has sent a memo out to all sellers of firearms and ammunition in this country saying that if you knowingly sell a firearm to an individual who is state compliant with the medical marijuana laws of their state, you are in violation of federal law. And of course, that individual who actually owns the gun is also in violation of federal law uh, because the federal law deems that anyone with a medical marijuana qualification is a, quote, drug addict under federal law, and thus it is illegal for them to own a firearm. So this is a full court press where the Obama administration is using a number of tools, a number of agencies to essentially go in, do its dirty work, and basically trump the will of the voters in these numerous states that have voted to recognize the medical utility of marijuana. Paul, let me wrap my brain around this, because I don't know if I've seen, as you call it, a full court press like this on any issue in recent history. What are the agencies? I mean, if we're just going to go through them, you know, you said IRS, the Department of Treasury, the ATF. What are all the agencies that are kind of currently uh, upping the ante at this point right now? Well, uh, you know, as, as we've noted, the Department of Justice is clearly leading this charge, but they're using the Department of Treasury. They're using the IRS. The DEA is obviously involved. The NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, is playing a role in this full court press. Uh, the the U.S. attorneys' offices. Uh, I just read today, in fact, uh, that several of the U.S. attorneys in California stated that they were going to, in fact, go after the newspapers that have accepted advertising from these legally compliant uh, medical marijuana operators and that they were going to threaten these publishers with up to three years in jail for violating federal law. So there is, as, as you just noted, it is hard to think of another issue where there have been so many different agencies and levels of government that have all basically swooped down at once and said, we are going to do everything in our power to take an industry and make sure that it goes out of business, to make it impossible for this business to operate legally any longer in this country. Paul, the first thing that pops in my head when hearing all this is the question, worse than Bush? Do you think so? Even under the Bush administration, we did not see this kind of coordinated effort among various agencies. The difference between Obama and Bush in many ways is one of PR. The Bush administration learned hard and quickly that they induced a lot of negative public sentiment when they sent in the DEA in the states like in the other states where voters had approved medical marijuana initiatives and forcefully shut down. It made for negative press, it made for negative images. The Obama administration learned from that, and even though they clearly have the same end game that the Bush administration had, they are using very different tools to try and achieve those ends. Basically, they are trying to shut this industry down. They are trying to punish the leaders in this industry, but they're trying to do it in such a way that doesn't attract the type of headlines the Bush administration uh, uh, were able to attract when they basically used the full power of the federal government to come in 
and try and make a statement. The Obama administration clearly has the same end game as the Bush administration, but their going, their methods are slightly different. Hey, Paul, this is Nick Hancock here. I have a question. Now, this uh, might require some speculation, but what is the why? What, what's the answer to the question why? What is the bottom line here? Is this about confiscating uh, you know, drugs, drug paraphernalia, and cash because the government is that broke? Or is this just about sending a message? What What is really going on behind, obviously, this is you know, it can't all just be about shutting down legitimate businesses. There has to be a uh, another prerogative here that they're going to uh, say that, you know, they need to fulfill eventually, right? What, what's going on here? Well, I wish I was a fly in the wall in this administration and can tell you what is going on behind the scenes. Unfortunately, I can just uh, repeat back to you what this administration is saying publicly and what they're claiming publicly their motivations are. Uh, you know, Friday during this press conference, all four U.S. attorneys stated that their concern, their reason for action, uh, was that they believed that there was abuse going on in the California medical marijuana system. Well, of course, there could be potential for abuse. There could be some potential for diversion of medical marijuana in California. But if that's the case, then let the state law enforcement of California deal with it. Why does the federal government have to come in with all of its power and all of its resources to handle abuses of California law? So clearly, the publicly stated motivation of this administration doesn't hold any real weight. What their actual motivations are is really really anyone's guess. Paul, you, you brought up this idea of enforcing state law, and this was actually one of the questions I wanted to, to bring to you, and maybe you can address it a little further. And there was a, a quote from that I read in an article from one of the U.S. attorneys down here in Los Angeles, and they said, while California law permits collective cultivation of marijuana in limited circumstances, it does not allow commercial distribution through the storefront model we see across California. So are the feds claiming the power to enforce state laws as they determine? Or as you were alluding to, isn't this something that if the people of California or the government of California determines that the law isn't being followed, shouldn't the feds get the hell out, basically? Well, certainly I think the feds should get the hell out. The reality is, is that clearly there could be better statewide and local regulations in California governing these activities. The irony is, is that the federal government is largely the reason why we don't have better local and statewide regulations in California. Because the federal government continues to maintain this prohibition, local politicians and statewide politicians continue to tell us that they cannot act appropriately with out running a foul of federal law. And in fact, in Friday's press conference, the U.S. attorneys made it clear that when local cities and local counties are enacting these guidelines to tax and regulate and enact common sense uh, governance over this industry, over these establishments, the U.S. Attorney's Office said, hey, no more. Going forward, you city politicians, you local politicians that engage in enacting these sort of regulations, well, you're engaging in the facilitation of a federal crime. So clearly, the federal government is doing everything in its power to assure that local and state governments in California and in these other states do not have the ability to better clarify and regulate these establishments. The federal government is creating a situation of anarchy and chaos in this industry, and they're actually preventing the locals on the ground. The federal government on the one hand says they want to see, but on the other hand are doing everything in their power to make sure uh, never are imposed. That's bring on Tenther Radio. This is uh, uh, from the Tenth Amendment Center. You can uh, check them out at radio.tenthamendmentcenter.com and 
And it's uh, episode 17. This uh, was with Michael Bolden and Nick Hankoff, uh, episode 17. Uh, they were also joined later on in the uh, podcast by Larry Pratt, the executive director of Gun Owners of America, discussing that uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives memo saying that medical marijuana patients don't have Second Amendment rights. It's a good show. Check it out, radio.10thamendmentcenter.com. When we come back, we'll have time for a radical rant uh, you won't believe some of the Oxycontin statistics I dug up. We're right back after this. In other states, broke down barrier. Cannabis for legalized, so broke down barrier. Join and speak your voice, broke down barrier. We gonna change the law, broke down barrier. We got to educate, broke down barrier. Yeah, this is Nayora, you know, bigging up USVI normal, working to legalize cannabis, you know, for the whole of the Virgin Islands. USVI Normal is a nonprofit organization working to legalize cannabis for the use by the industries and responsible adults. Do your part. Join USVI Normal. Register to vote. Pass the word. Voice your opinion. You can change the law. Contact us for more information at 340-244-9179. You can also visit our website at www.usvinorml.org. Look, I, you know, I uh, when I was a kid, I, I, uh, I inhaled uh, frequently. That was uh, that was that was the point. Remember, Mr. President, you once were just one bust away from being Barry the drug criminal. Life ain't a box of chocolates, gone. That's why people smoke weed and take bumps and drink way too damn much and get drunk and do it all over again. First of the month. What's up, guys? This is Miss High Times 2007, and you're chilling with us here at the Normal Podcast. Hello, this is Webb Hubble. Life insurance is now available for responsible marijuana smokers. For years, responsible marijuana smokers have not been able to access affordable life insurance products. Normal uniquely supports cannabis consumers. Two carriers have already agreed to offer all of their traditional life insurance products at all levels without excluding individuals who smoke marijuana responsibly. Help Normal and help yourself. If you've been declined for life insurance, are paying above market premiums, or simply want to know what now may be available in the way of insurance for marijuana smokers, contact me at info at mclaughlinonline.com or simply call me at 202-293-5566. You want answers? I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers. I want the truth. And you have offended a Shaolin temple. You can't handle the truth. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Radical Brand. The DEA allowed a 1,200% increase in Oxycontin manufacturing during the medical marijuana era. Nope, that's not a typo. It's not... Not uh, a misplaced decimal point. 1,200% increase in Oxycontin manufacturing during the medical marijuana era. Now, this comes from uh, a post up on alternate.org, and we've got the link for you at our blog, stash.normal.org. And it kind of comes as a follow-up to my earlier post on the increase of workplace drug test positives for oxycodone. Now, that was the post I talked about, I think, yesterday or a couple days ago, where uh, we found from Quest Diagnostics that oxycodone and hydrocodone were second only to marijuana in workplace positives, that marijuana workplace positives have declined by 20% since 2005, while workplace positives for oxycodone and hydrocodone have almost doubled during that same time. And we also found that the comparing the post-accident oxycodone uh, positive rates to the pre-employment testing rates were nearly three times greater, so it doesn't seem like the drug testing is really stopping them effectively. So as a follow-up to that, uh, remember that when your government tells you we need a drug-free America and we public from dangerous drugs of abuse, they only mean the drugs whose dealers and manufacturers don't make huge campaign contributions. Let me read to you from Alternate. 
The pharmaceutical companies that make oxycodone and its two dozen generic equivalents, such as endocodone, oxyfast, and percocet, are required by law to present an annual application to the Office of Diversion Control, as a part of the DEA, seeking approval for a quota of the drug's annual production. Should a company desire to manufacture more than the previous year, it must request an increase and the DEA must approve. In 1997, a year after prescription drug maker Purdue Pharma first brought OxyContin, the first branded version of oxycodone, to market, and coincidentally the first year of implementation of medical marijuana in the state of California, the total production quota approved by the Office of Diversion Control was 8.3 tons. 8.3 tons nationwide production quota of OxyContin. By 2011, it had risen to 105 tons, an officially sanctioned 1,200% increase over the same period that saw oxycodone emerge as what drug uh, experts are calling, quote, the Cadillac of America's prescription drug abuse crisis, end quote. Now, this kind of hits home to me as well because I visited Orlando, Florida this year at the end of August to visit the uh, uh, normal chapter, the excellent normal chapter at the University of Central Florida. And while I was hanging out with the college kids, they were telling me all about Florida's pill mill epidemic that they refer to in this alternate report. <clears throat> now, the way they described it, it sounded like the image our opponents use to explain what medical marijuana is like in California, right? Uh, one of the Florida guys was telling me, yeah, yeah, you can go to these little shady fake pain clinics, right? And you just complain about pain and you get a script from some shady doc and there you go. You can buy 500 Oxycontin pills, no problem. And, and, and another kid told me about how his friend maybe his friend, right, uh, used to do that, go get the Oxycontin pills at the pill mills and sell them so we could afford the ridiculously priced, overpriced marijuana in Florida. <laughs> so uh, it's like the circle of life, isn't it? Uh, what's incredibly disturbing to me is when the reporter in this alternate story asked a DEA official about the skyrocketing abuse rates of oxycodone and, you know, whether or not dialing down that quota might help. I mean, there's some historical precedents for this, right? Do you remember uh, Mother's Little Helper, right? If you've heard that song from the Rolling Stones, it referred to amphetamines, pills, you know, uppers that you could take, and they became quite an epidemic in the United States. And in the 1970s, there was control set on the quota of how much of those drugs the companies could manufacture, and we saw a decrease in amphetamine abuse. And remember Ludes? Who remembers Ludes? Anybody out there remember Ludes? Quaaludes, methylqualone. This is another actual success story in the DEA when uh, methylqualone was becoming more of a drug of abuse and more popularly used. They, uh, again, dialed down that quota uh, of how much the manufacturers could make and in the 1980s uh, successfully addressed a, a, a Quaalude abuse problem. Uh, now, do you think maybe that might help if we reduced from 105 tons the amount of Oxycontin that we're pumping out there into the, the public, right? Well, you will not believe the answer from the DEA on this. This is amazing. The supervisory special agent Gary Boggs basically says, we've got to pump out so much oxy for all the recreational users so there'll be enough left over for the medical users. Yeah, we've got to have all these oxy pumped out by the big pharmaceutical companies so the illegal users won't use up all the supply so the medical users can have enough access. Now, let me read you the quote. This is the actual quote from DEA Supervisory Special Agent Gary Boggs. Quote, What you have to understand, Boggs replied, is that you do have legitimate patients, and they're fishing from the same pond that the illegitimate patients are fishing from. So you have to be cautious not to restrict the quota to the point that when the legitimate parties go to the pool, all the fish haven't been taken out by the illegitimate parties, end quote. <laughs> Can you imagine the reaction we would get in the medical marijuana states if we said, well, gee, we have to plant 96 trees per medical garden that harvest a pound of peach so that the legal marijuana patients will have a left, enough left over after the illegal pot smokes. <laughs> exactly what they're saying is happening here in the state of Oregon. They're all freaking out because there's so much med medical marijuana production, so much production. And where's it all going if these patients can't get access? 
And yet when it comes to highly toxic, addictive oxycodone, oxycontin, backed by these pharmaceutical companies, we got to raise it 1,200% from 8.3 tons to 105 tons so there'll be enough left over for the legitimate patients. Now, this is partially why the Obama administration is initiating this crackdown on the medical marijuana businesses because they would have ability to shape policy in Washington if they are well-funded and organized. Let me go back to the alternate piece here. Quote, The Pharmaceutical Researchers and Manufacturers of America, or Pharma, employs more lobbyists in Washington than there are members of Congress. Since 2007, the group has spent more than $20 million annually on lobbying in Washington to see that its interests are protected. That influence is felt in the offices of the DEA, says Gene Hayslip, retired DEA agent from the Office of Diversion Control. Quote, For a DEA official to put his or her neck on the line to block a company's requested quota increase takes an awful lot of guts and a lot of hard work, particularly if that company is supporting members of Congress who have the power to block the agency's funding. End quote, he said. All the big-name pharmaceutical companies that make oxycodone, uh, including but not limited to Pfizer, Purdue Pharma, and Endo Pharmaceuticals, are members of Pharma. They also spend additional millions lobbying annually for their own specific interests. And they are the biggest donors to the national uh, biggest donors to a national nonprofit organization known as the American Pain Foundation. Now, according to the organization's most recent annual report, the American Pain Foundation had a budget of roughly $5 million for 2010. Endo Pharmaceuticals, the maker of a variety of oxycodone called Percocet, gave more than $1 million. Pfizer and Purdue donated between $100,000 and a half million dollars last year. So when you look at it that way, these lobbyists for pharma, more of them than we have members of Congress, and these $20 million that they spent annually on lobbying, and these $5 million that they put into the American Pain Foundation for basically pimping the problem, they can't have us pesky medical marijuana meddlers exposing hard science about cannabis's superior pain-killing properties. They can't spend that $20 million and have all those guys running around Washington and going to the expensive cocktail circuits learning that people who use medical marijuana get better results from their opioid painkillers and use the medical marijuana to wean themselves off of those products that they just spent $20 million to protect and promote. They can't have that $5 million they've created on, you know, trying to generate a need to try to convince America they've got this big pain problem and then have all of that time and effort and money actually advertise marijuana instead of their own product. So they're going to have their servants on both sides of the aisle see to it that that does not happen. There's a great chart from the Washington Post that shows Big Pharma's political contributions. Uh, This goes up to 2008, and it's just showing the uh, biannual elections since 1990. And it used to be that this was a chart that was heavily tilted toward Republicans. Back in 1990, 54% of Big Pharma's political uh, contributions went to Republicans. That got as high as 1996, 65%, uh, 2002 up to 74% went to Republicans. But come around 2008, it's 50-50 50-50 split. For, actually, 49% to Democrats, 51% to Republicans of the total money, that of lobbying money that is spent uh, in Washington in the 2008 election. 13 million on the Democratic side, 13 million on the Republican side, up from 1.5 million back in the 1990s on either side. This is all intertwined, people. If you're seeing those Occupy protests out there, if you're seeing those Tea Party protests that used to happen, they're basically focusing on the same thing, which as we the people down here don't seem to matter to our government, uh, don't seem to matter in our justice system. We are separated 1% versus 99%. Different justice if you've got the money. Jail time if you don't. And then nowhere does that show any more glaringly than in this 
recent crackdown on medical marijuana and comparing it to the oxycodone that we allowed a 1,200% increase in. I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us here for the show. If you're here listening live, stick around. Hour 2 Toker Talk Radio will dig a little deeper into the statistics. Also, we've got some uh, breaking news on raids in California. Uh, some terrible stuff going on all over the country in the name of Obama's crackdown on medical marijuana. For Cannabis Carry, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, take care of each other, Tokers. This is Normal Show Live, the voice of the Marijuana Nation. Dang it on one more time. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth.